All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode uh, of the uh, MarTech show. I've uh, been looking forward to this one, uh, not only because it's the sophomoric uh, show and uh, I have a sophomoric sense of humor, but uh, we're going to have an amazing guest with us today, uh, David Robb of the CDP Institute. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we're coming to the end of what has been, you know, one of the stranger summers, uh, yeah, in the history of, well, at least as far back as I recall. Um, uh, I was uh, taking a morning walk uh, the other day and uh, this was the sky that uh, appeared before me and I'm like, wow, I've actually entered the set uh, of Stranger Things. Uh, it feels like one of these Stranger Things uh, years, doesn't it? So uh, speaking of Stranger Things, you know, since the last uh, episode we did, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the craziness around TikTok uh, got a little bit more crazy, like the news of, uh, you know, Walmart teaming up with Microsoft because they're maybe bidding against Oracle for TikTok. Um, yeah, I didn't see that one coming. Uh, I was hoping actually to be able to announce today that uh, we were going to go ahead at chiefmartech.com and place our bid too. I mean, why not? Uh, I was going to try and convince, uh, you know, my guest David Robb if maybe we could team up the CDP Institute and chiefmartech.com. Um, but all right, um, welcome to the show. Uh, uh, I'm not going to take any more time away uh, from our guest today, uh, David Robb, founder of the CDP Institute, uh, general MarTech guru for as long as I've been in MarTech. Um, and uh, yeah, not only the founder of the CDP Institute, but I mean, you know, really like the person who even invented the field of the CDP coined the term. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, since then, like, um, yeah, I mean, the world has exploded uh, with CDPs. So uh, David, welcome. Thank you, Scott. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Good to be here. So uh, you just uh, completed a uh, survey of uh, the membership uh, of the CDP Institute and in that process uh, came up with, uh, yeah, some really incredible findings. Um, do you want to just, before we dive in that real quick, just give people a bit of a uh, introduction to what the CDP Institute does? Should they be joining the CDP Institute? You mean they're not? Shock, Scott, I, I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Uh, well, the Institute is a, a, a vendor neutral organization who's really dedicated to helping people do a better job with their customer data. And that often, of course, involves buying a CDP. So we have CDP vendors and actually other industry vendors as sponsors of the Institute, which is what keeps us uh, alive and, and, you know, eating and allows us to do all the things that we do. So we have a website, cdpinstitute.org, that uh, has a library of, of papers and uh, actually all kinds of other goodies. We have a newsletter, a daily newsletter that hopefully people will subscribe to at cdpinstitute.org, if I didn't mention that earlier. Um, and a whole bunch of other things. We do webinars actually ourselves and just uh, blogs and anything that we think of, frankly, to help people to, to learn and, and, and do better. So we're, we're, we're busy little beavers here. Yeah, well, let me uh, give a shout out uh, to uh, the newsletter that you mentioned there. Um, you know, I get a ton of emails every day, like hundreds. Uh, and there is only one email that I get, you know, Monday through Friday that I am guaranteed to read. Uh, and that is the CDP newsletter. Uh, not kidding. Uh, I mean, David does an amazing job of uh, uh, distilling uh, the news uh, from uh, the previous day into just three short little uh, vignettes, uh, you know, links to whether it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, thought leadership or survey data or news announcements, uh, acquisitions, new release. I mean, just a ton of great stuff. Um, and then you always have a way of uh, presenting it with a, a, a truly wry sense of humor uh, that I, uh, I greatly appreciate. So um, I encourage everyone to subscribe to the newsletter. CDPinstitute.org. All it. right. Hey, is, wait, um, there's something. Um, uh, oh, that's just the worker bees. Don't worry about them. Work with these. Okay. We're, we're, we're busy here at the Institute, as I said. All right. Um, well, uh, busy bees at the CDP. Uh, let's dive in. I know you uh, curated for us a series of uh, uh, some of the findings uh, from that membership survey that just released yesterday. So this is like hot off the press. Um, how about we start with this one, like uh, the customer data architecture. 
Um, I think one of the things I found really fascinating about this was uh, you were able to get a bit of this, you know, vertical evolution of, you know, having asked this question in 2017 and 2019 and now in 2020. Um, there's definitely a, a change happening in how people are thinking about their customer data architecture. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because many people ask versions of this question. Um, uh, is that for me there, uh, Bill? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, they deliver they, the mail too. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we're a hive of activity here. Um, and for a lot, for many years, that number never changed. Like 15, 20 percent, people say, "Yeah, we have all our data pulled together." And then all of a sudden, in this latest uh, round, we we actually saw quite a substantial increase in people who have unified customer database. So it was like finally. You know, there's, I think, was it you who was talking about punctuated evolution? Uh, you know, that we're, we're like, there's finally, like, after all these years of people trying, they do seem to be kind of getting their act together and seeing a substantial rise in, in, in the number who, who say they have a unified architecture. And notice this is not really a CDP question. That's just a generic question about database. So, yeah, progress. It's a good thing. Yeah. Well, those three, uh, the, the, the blue uh, choices there, uh, you know, whether it's many systems connected to marketing automation or CRM or connected to a unified customer database and a shared orchestration engine uh, or just many systems connected to a unified customer database. Yeah. Adding those all up. Yeah. It, it, it finally crossed over that, you know, That's right. uh, so, you know, having them. And again, I realize, you know, the people who are members to the CDP Institute are perhaps bias to be a little bit more savvy for this, but I still think that's a really remarkable milestone. Um, yeah. Could you just real quickly uh, uh, describe for folks the difference between those bottom two shades of blue? Like, well, well, again, these are questions in the survey. We didn't really, you know, give people a lengthy, uh, you know, explanation of what the answer, what it's supposed to mean, but one is unified customer database. You know, so I have a unified customer database that's sort of, the, you know, uh, table stakes here. And the others, I have a database and a shared orchestration engine. So not only do I have that database, but it's actually connected to something else, not necessarily in the same system, but certainly uh, people doing that. And, you know, we'll see a little later in some of the other research that having that shared database or having that shared orchestration engine, I should say, you know, really adds a lot of value because although, you know, it's nice to have data, but you kind of want to do something with it. Well, um, this also uh, impacts how people are happy, uh, relatively happy uh, with their MarTech. Right. So another question, about 15 questions or so. It's a fun survey. It's a lot of data to, to poke around in and, you know, like a pig in mud with these things. So one of the things we ask them is how happy they are from their, this question is, uh, you know, satisfied with the return on your mark, recent mark, MarTech investment. So again, not CDP. Uh, and return on investment specifically. So it's a pretty, you know, uh, a serious question and uh, rate it from one to five, dissatisfied to satisfied and then you just take an average. Um, and not terribly shockingly, the people who have disconnected systems are least satisfied with their MarTech and the people again, who have that unified database and that shared orchestration engine are, you know, the most satisfied and you know, these numbers differences don't look big, but they're actually pretty big differences in the grand scheme of things. So, you know, it, it, there, there's actually correlation, you know, if stuff works, you, know, you actually do get a better result when you have integrated systems. So, you know, yeah, integrated systems. I, imagine that. I yeah, found a couple of things that. interesting here. One was um, the people who said uh, don't know uh, are slightly happier than those who realize that they have many disconnected systems. Right. Uh, so apparently ignorance is bliss to a certain degree. Right. Uh, right. That, that's, that, that's, that, that's true. It is. The other um, thing actually that I found interesting here was, I mean, even for the highest scores, I mean, the people aren't like, at, at best they seem like somewhere in the middle, you know, of, all right, barely satisfied, you know, none of these are like, you know, four or higher uh, on average, like, why is that? I mean, well, it, it's because Martech is tough. I don't think, you know, and uh, you know, we, we do, I forget what the distribution was. I don't think it's on in the stack here. 10% um, yeah, or something like that, you know, actually gave it a five, but most of them were in that second, uh, you know, sort of kind of satisfied, you know, more satisfied than, than neutral. So, so it, it is, um, there, there's a good number, but 
you know, the one lesson from that, to be honest, is that just because you've done all this stuff right, doesn't mean that you're going to have, you know, a fabulous result. You can have the best technology in the world and really have it just, you know, while humming on eight cylinders or however many cylinders you want to hum on. And it's still not necessarily going to mean that everything else happens. Actually, we'll talk about, we have some really interesting research about some of the non-technical um, issues that get in people's way too. Well, let's uh, dig into a little bit of the, uh, uh, that data as well too. You want to talk through this? Yeah, so, so the way the survey uh, analysis is organized, and again, you can download it at cdpinstitute.org, um, is we ask people uh, about a number of things. And one of the things we ask them about is, well, what, do you, what MarTech management techniques are you using? So we have in the survey, we have the first section talks about some of those changes over time. The second set of analysis looks at people who were leaders versus followers and leaders are people who are highly satisfied and have a unified architecture and have good and have CDP actually and have a privacy, a good privacy in place. So, you know, things who have done stuff that really indicates they're doing a good job. And that's about 20% of the audience. And we did a whole bunch of analysis is comparing what leaders do versus what everybody else does, which is a typical, you know, kind of way to do this thing. And, and the leaders are more likely to do all of these different MarTech things. They have a center of excellence. They have, you know, a long-term plan. They use agile. These are organized in decreasing order of difference in case you're wondering. Uh, they, they do technical standards. They, any any of these techniques actually correlates with satisfaction. So just like having something intelligent in place, this is sort of the lesson here matters except for outside consultants and yeah that was uh, fascinating and yeah and you know you're uh, you know i made my living as an outside consultant for many years so i didn't take this too personal uh, i did consider removing it uh from the survey results but <laughs> but honest since i'm no longer an outside consultant i don't have to uh the reality is that people are are all the other things that all those first five things on the list are investments that you make in your company, you invest in your staff, you build out a COE, you do the planning, you have metrics, you do all this. Stuff. The last one is like, well, my company can't do this. So I'm going to hire somebody else. I'm just mm -hmm. going to bring in, you know, bring in somebody else to do it for me. And guess what? If you don't make that investment, those outside consultants are probably not going to solve the problem. Now, again, you outside have robots consultants there. are great. Uh, uh, no, there's a rumor that we have a robot. We've never seen one. I, uh, I, I don't. I, I, I don't see a robot. I don't know why. Uh, no, why people think we have one? Stuff in my garden. I might start seeing things like that. So yeah, I think, yeah. Um, I think that's important. probably it. Um, but uh, you know, because we we don't we're a little skeptical of technology around here, so we don't we don't. I, so that's robotic process automation. I, I'd always really uh, wondered what the definition was. It, 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 it would be if, if, if there were one. But we, we think, you know, it's a lot of hype about the robot stuff. We don't take it too serious. Um, so anyway, so the outside consultants, at least my theory on this. Interesting thing, one of the many interesting things, answers to this survey and the one we did a year and a half ago to these questions, very, very similar. So a lot of that stuff hasn't changed. Like, you know, guess what? You got to do your homework. You got to eat your spinach. You got to have these me methods of management in place to do this stuff. So, MarTech so, selection. Um, all right. This was another one, like uh, when, I, when I was first going through the report yesterday, like it immediately popped out uh, at me uh, because yeah, you know, I sort of, with both hats I wear, you know, the work I do at HubSpot and then also, yeah, just is, uh, uh, you know, the chief martech.com uh, hat. Um, yeah, it's all been around like, hey, can we actually get these things more integrated? Uh, and so seeing like integration uh, with internal systems and or external systems to be the most important thing now uh, when selecting technology, more important than costs, more important than features, more important than ease of use, although it's nice to see ease of learning and use is probably the second there. Um, was this what you were expecting? Uh, well, again, very similar to the results uh, the last time we asked these questions. So it was kind of what I was expecting. And, and uh, I forget there were some minor changes. Um, I'd have to look at the old one. But, you know, there's two ways to look at this data, right? What, the one is like, what, as you say, what's most, what do people look at the most? And the other is what do leaders do differently from the non-leaders, from everybody else? So, yeah, everybody looks at inter integration with internal systems, but that doesn't really uh, indicate whether you're doing a good job or not, just everybody does that, right? But the people who 
look at cost are substantially less, ha less likely to be leaders, right, that last row on the bottom there, than the ones who are leaders who tend not to look at cost as much as they look at others. They're more likely to look at features and external integration and again, features, sophistication and breadth. So those are the things that really kind of separate the, um, oh, oh, thank you. Um, uh, busy day here. I, I don't wow. know what's going on there. Is that a cow? Um, uh, oh, that, that's Enrico Caruso. Hello, <laughs> I am Enrico Caruso, the famous operatic tenor. I see there is a camera and I assume an apt and willing audience. Uh, yeah, Enrico, uh, we are kind of, wh why are you here? Because I work for you, David. Oh, I, I didn't realize that you, I thought you were off performing. Oh no, we are on sabbatical at the moment. I However, see. I do have to tell you, Today, the printer is broken. Bill wanted me to tell you that the printer is broken and we are doing everything in our power to fix it as soon as possible. Uh, thank you for sharing that. You are welcome. Enrico. Okay, Hello, well. I am Enrico Caruso. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, sorry, Enrico. Uh, sorry, Scott. Uh, Enrico, he, he, he's moonlighting for yes, us, actually. I'm Nice. Yes. Uh, you know, this, um, uh, I am so happy that it will be the second episode of the Martech show that goes down in history is possibly the most surreal. So this is great. <laughs> well, you, you know, a lot, lot going on the CDP Institute, I'll tell you. All right. So uh, anyway, so yeah, so, so again, so the, the point of that slide to me is that it, it stresses the importance of kind of doing your homework, doing the features, looking at these things, you know, not just looking at focusing on uh, on, on cost and, you know, so, so it's the best practices that, that you know, again, as a consultant, uh, I, but the, what I've always preached for, me, for a long time to, to, to all my clients is you got to do your work, you got to do your homework, mm -hmm. you got to look at, understand your use cases, do all those things we talk about. So good to see that, uh, that the data supports that. All right. So, um, oops, there we go. All right. So this was another intriguing set of answers. Um, uh, like who owns uh, MarTech uh, in the companies you surveyed? Right. So we asked uh, three questions about, you know, who's in charge and is it a specific person? Is it the IT department? Is there somebody within marketing? So do each, does each department within marketing run its own MarTech? And, uh, you as chief MarTech will no doubt be delighted to see that the leaders are indeed a little more likely than everybody else to have a MarTech staff who runs it. And more to the point, the guys who don't have a MarTech department are way less likely to be leaders. And these things correlate with satisfaction uh, as well. So putting the market, uh, putting the IT department in charge, putting each group in marketing, letting everybody do their own thing, not really a best practice. So again, no surprise, certainly to you, but uh, good to have some empirical uh, data for that. And then we also, I don't think we have a slide here on it. We looked at departments where there were more than one person involved because they could, they could answer any of those questions. Uh, and, and again, not surprisingly, um, the more departments involved, generally speaking, the less happy people were. Mm -hmm. That probably applies to almost any. <laughs> pretty much, like, pretty much everything in life. Be, yeah. yeah, having to eat. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, right. So let's dig into the actual CDP uh, research of this as well, too. Um, uh, quite a evolution here. Yep. Yep. So this is the third section of the report. Again, we did the trends, we did the best practices, and then we said, okay, let, let's let's get to the good stuff. Let's really talk about CDP. And uh, again. Um, you know, great progress in CDP deployment, no surprise there. And again, bearing in mind, this is membership of the CDP Institute, so far from a representative sample of the universe, but, uh, you know, big leap and probably um, somewhat reflective of reality. Uh, again, sample size issues, notwithstanding, you know, it took, takes a little while for these things to get deployed, but we, we saw a very, very large jump uh, from about 18 months ago uh, in the number who had it deployed. Interestingly, the number who had deployment planned in process were a little down. Could be some COVID stuff going on there. Could be that, um, you know, I don't think we're anywhere near market saturation, but but there's a little bit of change in, in uh, like a lot of the early, early adopters like they're already. And then uh, the other ones, once you get to, to me, you know, planning deployment within the next 12 months, maybe that's real, 
planning deployment after next one once doesn't mean anything. Obviously, if all the people who had even had said they had deployment in progress in 2017 had actually been deployed by 2019, that would have gone up much higher. So clearly, you know, you can't, uh, can't just project that oh, everybody who says it's in progress is going to be delivered next year. I mean, everyone complaint. who ever told me they were going to have their digital transformation done in 12 months, I checked back a year later and they were like, yeah. That's yeah, yeah, not, yeah, exactly. Not everybody. So here we're looking at it, uh, and again, being a data geek, um, you know, we broke it out by company type and, the, and then by company size, just to see, because certainly the, the impression is that, you know, MarTech is a B2B C thing. And I think this is where our sample uh, bias really comes in because a lot of the people obviously in the CDP Institute membership are MarTech vendors. And even a lot of people call themselves B2P when you look at the companies, a lot of them are like MarTech related companies. So this probably understates the relative proportion of B2C, but very interesting that the deployment and process number, the ones who kind of, which I, again, she is an aspiration more than like a statement of fact, that's so much higher for those guys. So the B2C guys really, maybe they take a little longer, maybe they're still working on it, but they definitely have gotten the message, they've gotten the Bartek uh, CDP message, they wanna do that. So to me, that's an important leading indicator. And then by company size was interesting because there's the perception that CDP is a big company thing. And at least in this data, that just doesn't show up at all. So you know, everybody, most everybody, not the really tiny ones, kind of weird, but, uh, most everybody needs a CDP you know, size notwithstanding. So everybody should go out and buy one, cdpinstitute.org. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed, where can they get this? <laughs> cdpinstitute.org. Uh, for the MarTech, like, do you think it's because MarTech companies are just more savvy and they want to have, uh, you know, a CDP in their sack? Or is it that, um, I mean, I, as far as I understand, about 36% of the market MarTech companies out there actually now consider themselves to be CDP you know, well, I think that, you know, again, bearing in mind who's uh, of course they have a CDP. Uh, lots of the people uh, certainly in my in that membership are uh, CDP vendors in particular. So for sure that that bias is <laughs> in a bit. But the other thing that goes on, and I don't remember if we have those slides here or not, um, is that uh, the companies often say that their CRM or their marketing automation system is a CDP. I, someplace I think we'll get into that a little later. Um, so a lot of the B2B guys have that and they say, oh, that's a CDP. Plus, you know, it's just cool to have a CDP. So, you know, who, who, who wouldn't want to, so of course I have a CDP. I have several. You, know, fact, you, you right? made that cool, you know. Right? Yeah, we made it cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so are they happy? Uh, are they happy? Of course they're happy, right? They're CDP users. Goes back to our, uh, our, our uh, Enrico, uh, how's the copier? The copier has been fixed. Oh, well. Bill wanted me to tell you. Well, okay. and so here I am to tell you okay. that the copier has been fixed. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Would you not interrupt? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, okay, good. Uh, it's uh, Nico gets, he, he, like, he's a bit of a camera hog, <laughs> which is odd because he's a cow. Like you would think he would be a camera cow or pig, but, but he's, anyway. Um, <laughs> So I'm yeah, so the guys who have CPs <laughs> are actually much happier than it's, it's you know than, than the guys who don't have CDPs, and and it, it just the nice thing about this graph is it's such a nice smooth curve, right? The closer you get, the better it is. It's not that CDPs are like the key to happiness, you know. Although we could start a religion along those lines, but it's really that the CDP is a sign of your Martech maturity in general. If you have a CDP, mm -hmm. you're probably good at Martech. And so, and so it's, you know, the causation probably runs the other way, uh, but all we know about is correlation anyhow. Ah, so CDP capabilities. Uh, okay, so um, not too surprisingly, right? But, you know, it's actually, there's, this is only surprising because there are people who say, ah, nobody knows what a CDP is. Everybody says they're a CDP. CDP doesn't mean anything which of course is fighting words, you know, here at the CDP Institute. But in <laughs> fact, you get a pretty clear answer. Like, you know, the message we've been putting out now for a long time is that, you know, CDP is a unified, uh, you know, package software builds a unified persistent customer database that shares the data with other systems. So it's all about building that unified persistent customer database. Well, by golly, at least the people who are members of the CDP Institute, they get that. 
it's all about collecting the data. That's what you want to do. And then you want to do the identity matching. You know, those are the kind of the two top two things that a CDP does. And then hmm. after you get that base in place, then you begin to think about the other things, you know, about delivering profiles in real time and coordinating treatments across channels and, you know, doing offer and product recommendations to stuff down closer to the bottom. Those are more advanced and less common uses. So at least we think that this just kind of shows that there's a little more clarity in what people understand than, than perhaps is sometimes assumed. So we One take of the things I wanted to ask you about this, because, uh, you know, there's another thread we won't go deeply into today, but, uh, you know, I'm uh, passionate about all these no code uh, solutions and what that means is, you know, broadly open to uh, a philosophical debate. Uh, and I think uh, you, you've sometimes been a foil to me on that of sort of pushing back of like, you know, is the world going to be a better place when anyone can do that stuff? Uh, I think at one point you referred to one of it is like throwing a brick through the window of, you know, the IT department. But I do notice here, right, like a couple of these capabilities of non-technical users extracting customer segments, uh, and then much lower, but still really interesting, non-technical users creating predictive models. That sounds kind of in that spirit of no code. What's your take on that? Well, it's certainly in the spirit of self-service. Okay. And, and uh, I don't think anyone, and certainly not I, would, would argue that end users shouldn't be empowered to do stuff. Um, and, and that's what that's about. Uh, you know, there, we haven't seen a no-code CDP yet, I don't think. There are some no-code aspects. The CDP vendors are making it easier, like, you know, there's some no-code API connector builders, for example, that um, are, uh, you know, being, being deployed by, by vendors even as we speak. That's actually a common thing. So there is more self-service happening because people don't want to be uh, relying on IT. And I think, um, I think actually, the next one talks a little about benefit, talks about that in particular. So there is no question that, that people want to do more no code stuff. So yeah, so down there at the bottom, there are less reliance on IT resources, not the main reason. The interesting thing about this uh, stratification of the answers is again, up at the top, unified customer view. Again, very, very clear. This is why I buy a CDP. This is what I want to get out of it. So less confusion than some folks would say. And then after that, it's like, it's almost a, a, a maturity model, a capability mm -hmm. sequence there. After I get the unified customer view, the next thing I do is my data analysis. All right, then orchestration is like, whoa, what's that doing there? Because that's like a super complicated thing. That's like the last thing you do. And we'll talk about talk about how that happened, what's so weird about that. Um, but then message selection and then predictive modeling. So those are all functional things, things that marketers do, ways to make money. Then after that becomes the cost saving ones, less time, access to data, faster response, less reliance on IT, all the sort of like, you know, operational benefits and then way down at the bottom message delivery because that's not what a CDP does. You know, some CDPs have message delivery capabilities, but that's not why you buy a CDP. It's something that, oh, you know, it's nice to have it in my CDP so I can avoid some integration issues. So this uh, very, very clear kind of sequencing of these uh, related to how we think people really use it. So again, nice to see that uh, the world is doing exactly what I think the world should do. <laughs> Oh, well, a good one that happens. Um, all, right. all right, so all explain right. this pie chart to so me. So this one, yeah, this one's not in the, uh, there's a version of this in the report that's a bar chart, but I decided this was a better way to do it. Um, we asked the people who have a CDP, well, what shape is your architecture? And we had that earlier set of questions. So we could cross tab those two things. And again, the data geek in me here. And you would think, well, everybody has a CDP is going to have a, you know, a shared customer database, right? Because, hey, isn't that, that the, def the definition? And, and we saw from the ones we just saw, that, yeah, people actually do think that's the definition. It's not like that they misunderstood. And yet, um, you can look at the blue ones on the bottom there, and that adds up to a little more than half. I can't do the math in my head right now. Um, 65%. Uh, but only two of those, the 43% say they actually have a unified customer database. And then you got the 22% who are talking to marketing automation and CRM and kind of connecting their other systems to that effectively using it as a CDP, which again, we don't think makes a lot of sense. But, and then the other, so like, who are these other people? Who are these 19% of people who say they have a CDP, who say they have all disconnected systems? It's like, like, what do you got? Are you been in Scott's garden smoking what he's been growing or what's going on here, guys? So that was like a really, that was like a mystery question that we had to, had to an answer. Um, uh, sorry, I thought I saw something. Um, 
that was like, well, okay, what's going on? So we kind of like to delve into the data even deeper because like nothing, I'm not obsessed or anything uh, to see what was back. going on there. Hmm? The robot is back. The robot is back. Okay. Oh, really? I, oh, okay. I, I've never seen it. I, I saw a robot. I'm just saying. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm skeptical. I, it's a hype. I mean, is the many disconnected systems, is this like, is this more of a function of organizational challenge rather than technical challenge? It's like, okay, well, this group, you know, got permission to deploy a CDP, but yes, you know, still connecting up all the other different software that probably technically could be connected into that CDP, but, you know, different groups or different departments um, haven't quite acquiesced yeah. on that. Um, well, okay, you've just given away the end of the movie, but uh, that is in fact <laughs> what we concluded <laughs> after much analysis. You know, you could have saved me like two weeks of work here, Scott, if you just said that. So, I, yeah, I, so we, same thing happened for me in the first five minutes of the sixth sense. So, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the interesting things was we was remember remember we, we said earlier that thing about orchestration. So I think if the next slide maybe if these things are in the right order, um, we 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 said okay we we had this hypothesis, maybe those 19% just don't understand. Maybe they really don't get what CDP is. So we, we looked at their answers, the answers actually of the people who said they had a unified customer view and said they had many disconnected systems. And the thing that jumps out, you know, most of the answers are pretty much consistent you know, on, on the heat map here, every, you know, the, the rows are pretty much the same color going across, which just says that not much differentiating going on except for that orchestration one. It's like, like the people who were expecting orchestration as a CDP benefit were way less likely to say that they had a unified database. So like, huh, that's interesting. Why is that? I remember orchestration was kind of out of sequence anyway. It shouldn't have been that high up because it's a much more sophisticated thing. It's like, okay, there's something weird going on there. So we dug around a little and the conclusion was exactly what you said. I think the next slide highlights it, that people who are are less satisfied, who, who are somehow doing a, a less good job, are less mature. They less understand what a CDP is. Uh, I, I don't remember what the next slide is, but and you're you're I, you're probably reading that one. Okay, so this this um so, okay, folk drilling down on orchestration. So that orchestration answers. We let's, let's look at it. Um, and yeah, so who said orchestration was a benefit? The ones who said orchestration was a benefit were the ones who were the furthest away from CDP deployment um, or were less likely to actually have that on the bottom, a unified database. Remember those last two rows there, the 45 and the 44. So, or they had one system that does everything, but they were not, the ones who were most likely were the ones who didn't know what was going on, who had many disconnected systems, who used marketing automation or CRM, which isn't really CDP, you know, or were further away from the point. So these are the least mature, the least knowledgeable people were the ones who were most likely to say that orchestration was a benefit to a CDP, which suggested, as I say, they really, they just didn't understand. So then we dug into a little further um, and we looked at, I think the next, the next one here, we said, okay, let's look at those obstacles by CDP status. So then, and, and CDP status being, again, actually a better proxy for mar marketing maturity than the direct question about the state of your customer system. So you get a similar uh, answer if you look at the other one. And we saw that sure enough, the, the obstacles that you cite to your CDP depend on where you are in that maturity mm -hmm. level. So the guys who are the least mature, who have no plans, don't know, or plan to start deployment, they're the ones who are most likely to say management doesn't support it, the budget's not adequate, I have issues with cooperation across the organization. So their organizations are the least uh, organized, they're, they're the least mature, and those are the ones who have those issues. And then the theory is that the data suggests is, okay, the next group of people who are the ones in the CDP uh, progression who are like thinking about deployment, you know, within 12 months or actually even have deployment in process. So that's that middle group where those bars are the highest, the middle blue bar, light blue bar there. Those are the ones who are going to cite issues about tech staff and they can't get the data together and they can't apply the data. You know, they can't, you know, they're, they're wrestling with the technical issues. Those are the highest uh, priority issues for them. So again, so that's, and then the ones on the very end, the guys who actually have that deployment that CDP deployed, those are the ones who are saying, no, you know, I have the thing in place, so our marketing staff doesn't have the time. 
you know, we got it, but but we we just we we just can't get the full value from it because because we're resource constrained, and and I take that very much to be a time, not a skill, even though the question conflates the both of them. So you know, there 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 is this this progression of of, tra of hurdles that you have to leap over, and 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 it shows up really clearly. So and but those are all maturity things. You know, those are all coming down to your organizational maturity. So so yeah, and and I. I don't even remember what, which slides we have. We looked at so much data here. But if we look at the ones, um, yeah, no, we went on. Uh, if we look at who's satisfied and not satisfied with the CDP, because we actually ask a question, it's not in this deck, uh, about uh, the, of the deployed ones, the, the actual surveys is deployed and, and, and we're getting value and deployed, not getting value. And well, the guys who are not getting value are, are the guys who have all these organizational issues way, way, way higher. Again, not surprisingly. And they're also more likely to say they have many disconnected systems. So they do understand what they were supposed to get out of their CDP, but they simply haven't been able to do it. And it's, it's, it's organizational. Issues. Actually, that one group, this is in the report, not here, that was the one group that said more that, that's cited IT issues, IT staff issues, uh, more than half of them. They, they had way the, way the highest level of complaint about IT were the guys who had CDP deployed, but weren't getting value from it. So take that ITP people. <laughs> All right, well, I'm not gonna open up that can of worms. Uh, 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 I know we're running short on time, but I did wanna also hear from you on, uh, yeah, your, your, your focus here around privacy compliance uh, lately, I think has been a really important topic and you got some great data on that as part of the survey. Yeah, we, we did, you know, where the Institute is, is actually putting a lot of energy into privacy right now because it's important for any number of reasons. And, and it's, a, you know, something that many of our constituents are struggling with. Um, so you, it's actually a new privacy newsletter, a weekly newsletter that's separate from, from the regular newsletter, just to focus on that. Uh, but anyway, we, so we, in, for the first time, included a question about privacy in the survey. And the answers were quite intriguing. We, we asked, um, about levels. It's the first time we did the question, so we kind of struggled with it a little, but, you know, we're trying to, you know, do you make, what's, what's your status with, with, with your, what's your company's um, approach to privacy, right? So like, you know, do you, do you ignore it completely or pay a little attention? Do you actually like really try to comply or do you actually like see privacy as a competitive advantage and, and do more than just comply? And, you know, about 28% of them said we actually do more than just comply. The majority, at least 58% uh, of the total you know, at, at least try to comply. But very interesting splits, again, by, by company size, the bigger companies much more likely to really stress privacy. We're glad to see that. The, the MarTech guys, for whatever reason, the B2B guys in general, that's mm -hmm. a bit of a surprise, actually more likely to uh, stress privacy. A lot of them, I think, are actually selling privacy-related technology, so they may be doing it to help sell it. Um, you know, and again, another marker of maturity, uh, the ones who have a CDP deployed and are successful with it uh, are almost 44% of those guys. CDP supports privacy. It's one of the things that CDP makes easier to do, privacy compliance. Um, you know, and then again, as you get less mature, uh, th that goes down, but at least most of them are trying to comply, even if they're not trying to do more than minimum. Um, and some slight, slight uh, regional differences too. So interesting stuff. You know, a lot, cool. lots going on in CDP land. What's this puppet? Oh, wait, another bee. I, I don't know. Well, thank you. A pen, three pens. I, I don't know why, I but. I thought the slides were pretty, so I just wanted to look at them. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Bill, or maybe you're Bob. I don't know which one. You're Bill. Hey, thanks. Did Bob tell you about the copier? Uh, yes. It's fixed, yeah, yeah. Good, to, right, good to know. You thought the robot broke it. He always thinks there's a robot. Yeah, I, I don't, I've never seen the robot, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, no. Bob swears he has. No. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I love All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. They, yeah. I don't know. I'm, the anyway, like apparently the copier's been fixed. The world's getting so. better than that. Um, all right. So uh, for our uh, audience, uh, yeah, if, if, if there's a question you'd like to ask uh, David, um, you know, feel free to plop something into the Q&A there. Uh, if you're comfortable with it, you know, we'll also promote you up to uh, the video, uh, you know, so it's uh, a little bit more of uh, a... I don't know, feels a little bit more interactive that way. But uh, while we're waiting for a question or two to come in, there was one at the very beginning uh, of the session where uh, Shane Lennon had asked, uh, when you say unified customer database, do you mean one technical database or more like a unified view across a technical implementation on like a data lake or a data mart? 
I actually mean a physical database that, that ingests the data and puts it together in one place. And the reason we think that's really important is because a lot of analysis that you want to do requires historical information and your source systems often, they may not throw away the old data, but they'll often kind of archive it off to the back and you can kind of get it out of the way. Cause, and sometimes they will just overwrite it because just depends the operational system may not need to know what somebody's address was last year. Like really, who cares? As long as I can ship to them today. Now, in fact, you know, you'll have a change of address record in most systems, but, but it'll, it'll, it'll be harder to get at. So we feel that for a lot of the work you do in a CDP, uh, particularly the historical analysis, you really do want to have your own copy of the data so you can sort of decouple yourself from those operational systems. And also, also historically, the operational systems didn't want to be queried directly. So you did pull the data out into a data lake. All right, that's the other approach. And you can think of the CDP in some ways as a data lake, but also the data lakes, you know, they're really tools more for the data scientists. They're not for all those, you know, citizen data analysts and, you know, no code self-service. Um, Say it with a smile, <laughs> self-service, no code. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, you know, the, the irony of that, which I've been dying to say to somebody is like, we talk about citizen this, citizen that. Like citizen citizens are not doing such a great all right, job. That's a whole right other topic, yeah. I, I mean, I just want to say that. So like, I don't know why this is all this like, like, like let's, let's get that together before we are so proud of being citizen anything else is. Um, all right, no, there's a related question. So we're now, uh, everyone is shy today here. So we're getting a lot of anonymous questions coming in. Um, uh, I think maybe the puppets, uh, you know, scared them off here, but um, an anonymous attendee puppets. is asking, what is the difference between a CDP and a traditional single customer view? Because we have been hearing about the single customer view for. <clears throat> okay, excellent question. So. The traditional single customer view, which functionally is absolutely identical to a CDP, was something that was custom built. You went out and your IT department built it, or you hired Epsilon or Axiom or you know one or Merkle or you know most of those guys are well, actually those guys are all still around. Um, you know to build it for you it was a big project, took years, cost many millions of dollars. Like every other IT project, it was over budget, late, and didn't deliver most of what you wanted. So. The reason I named the CDP category, and I named it, I didn't invent it, I just gave it a name, was because back in 2013, I was beginning to see systems that were actually packaged software that was doing that database building, which otherwise until then was always a custom system. You used to build a database and then you would attach a campaign manager to it or attach a predictive modeling system to it. But they, they were two separate things. So, so seeing those together in package software, that's what made a CDP different. That's still the again, part of our definition. So the package software bit of that is really what's different from other sorts of unified persistent customer databases. All right, I'm going to give the last question to a mutual friend of ours, uh, Anand. Uh, Anand, I've now promoted you up if you wanna ask your question live over video, are you there? Yes, I am here, let's see. Is my video even up? Oh, well, um, any rate. Um, so, David, you know, what, what trigger pain points have you seen that, uh, you know, that cause most organizations to need to implement a CDP? I mean, I think many of us know, like, the, the, the hypotheticals and certainly the aspirational, but where have you seen that trigger points where an organization says, okay, we've really got to invest in this because we are well beyond, um, uh, you know, well beyond the pain that we can deal with with regards to customer data all over the place? Well... You know, we used to joke the way you sell a CDP is, is, is your, your sales. So do you have customer data? Yeah, I have customer data. Is your customer data perfect? Well, of course not. Well, you need a CDP. Everybody needs a CDP if you have customer data. Um, but the reality is that when you really dig into it, what makes a CDP use case, what, what people want that they can't get is they can't usually get the data from multiple sources together in the same place or use it together, which in theory you could do you know, by accessing it remotely, but in reality, you got to pull it into in the same place. So we have a pain point, like I want my call center agent to be able to see what somebody just did on the web so I can deal with that. Or I want my, my email segmentation to incorporate what people bought uh, in the store as well as online, or I want to do retargeting and I want to remove people from retargeting if they bought 
something quickly, not slowly. I got to get it from my e-commerce system into my retargeting listing system. All those kinds of things that require connecting data across multiple systems. Those are the things that really force you into CDP land. It's pretty clear. Um, one, more, uh, one more question. I just can't resist. Uh, these questions are great. Uh, just promoted uh, John Gusev here. Uh, John, if you want to ask your question. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, David, I was interested. Did you in any way drill down into uh, the topic of orchestration in regards to what type of orchestration companies were trying to accomplish, be it you know, more acquisition-based or customer service-based or retention-based type use cases? Uh, no, not in that survey. Uh, we have done some analysis along those lines elsewhere. Uh, we have a big use case library. Actually, if you go to cdpinstitute.org, we just put, we just added that recently. Um, and there's about 50 or so use cases that are mostly based on case histories. Um, so we analyze those by those categories. Uh, and you know, they're, again, not, not a statistically valid, any, not a necessary represent, but if you think about it for about three seconds, you realize the CDP is about customer data. So the number of acquisition use cases is kind of limited. You can maybe do some lookalike modeling. You can, you know, you know uh, sometimes CDP usually, you know, could theoretically pull in third party data, but that's not really the focus of it. So most CDP use cases are dealing with existing customers, which means that they're more about, uh, you, you know, lifetime value and, and cross sell and upsell and those sorts of things. We're now beginning to see more use cases around customer service. Uh, the customer service or customer success departments making more use of CDPs, which has always been a kind of an obvious application, but they tend to be a little separated. So now they're kind of getting excited when they see that, oh, well, this data is available. I can use that too. Actually, other departments in the company, that's one of the big trends in the industry right now, is uh, departments outside of marketing uh, being excited about using a CDP. So there's a little bit of that. Retention is, again, very much part of, of, of that core marketing function. So that we see a lot of if that helps. Great, thank you. Cool, well listen, thank, uh, thank you to the audience here for sticking with us a little bit longer. David, thank you uh, for yeah, taking this time, sharing this all with us. Um, where can people go to get a copy of this report again? Uh, well, you know, www.cdpinstitute.org. I, I, I'm embarrassed I didn't put it on one of my slides. Um, but yeah, that's there. I, I, and yeah, Scott, great, thanks for having me so much. Uh, if you need any copies made, we're good to go here. All right. Yeah, I, I, I do want to actually get, uh, you know, like selfies with the uh, puppets at some point. <laughs> so hopefully we can make that happen. <laughs> we'll see if we can make that happen. <laughs> Awesome. Right. Well, uh, uh, thank you again. Um, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, two weeks from now, we will be uh, doing the live recording of uh, our third episode uh, with uh, Erica Seidel, who I often call the, you know, MarTech recruiter to the stars uh, of the connective good. And uh, we're going to be digging into the topic of the road from marketing ops to marketing tops, uh, you know, the career path for marketing ops and marketing tech folks uh, into leading the whole marketing shebang. So look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Have a great day.